okay? That's just kind of a stiff rock, but, but for a granite, that, um, that makes a lot of sense. Granite, I think, it even has a, a, low, a higher bulk modules. And let's say that we have a change of temperature of 100 degrees C, and we have a linear dilation, thermal dilation coefficient of 10 to the minus 5, 1 over C. Can you tell me what is going to be the change in sigma 1, 1? Three times, uh, so I have the beta, I'm, I'm missing the k, wait, wait, missing the k. So k is 10 to the 10, right? Pascal, and this is 10 to the 2 degrees centigrade. So what do I get? So minus 5, plus 5, plus 7, right? So 3 to 10 to the 7, so that's equal to 30 MPa. So what it appeared before as a very small strain, if you have a very stiff rock, it can go into very high stresses. 30 MPa is an effective stress that you get by burying rock at a depth of five kilometers or so. So it's a very, very high uh, stress. And if you were to somehow modify the temperature uh, to 100 degrees C, you can cause stresses which are in the range of the uh, actual state of stress of uh, these formations uh, in situ. So remember, this is positive, so which, which means compression. Who can tell me what kind of tests are we're going to do now? All right, so yeah, so we, we do this all the time. It's, it's a very, it's, a, it's an example of boundary conditions which are closer to, to many applications in the subsurface. Plane strain, okay, okay, but uh, there are many cases of plane strain, right? What? No, no. We're going to do again the 1D strain case in which we have constant overburden but no strains on the sides. And again, that applies for cases in which you have a thin and long reservoir, and there is constant overburden on top of it. So we're analyzing a piece of material, which is going to be, let's say, uh, somewhere over here. And we want to analyze what is going to be the change in horizontal stress. we know that the vertical stress uh, is going to stay constant. And we're go what we're going to do now in this case is we are going to inject a fluid at a low temperature. So we're placing a wellbore over here, and that wellbore, we're going to inject fluids at low temperature, and I want to see what is the effect of those fluids at low temperature on the state of stress. Okay, so in order to do that, uh, we're going to use exactly the same equation that, that we have been using for the two previous cases. And I'm going to make one small modification here. Uh, instead of 
we're going to to start uh, writing gradients and derivatives and things like that. So instead of using this delta t, I'm just going to call this theta, where theta is defined as t minus initial temperature. So it's, it's a delta t, all right? But uh, we're just going to call it theta. All right. So uh, let's write the equations for this one. Uh, same as before, I'm going to neglect, neglect the shear stresses in this coordinate system. I'm just going to work with the normal stresses. I'm going to assume uh, isotropy as we have done in previous cases. So stiffness matrix is this one. And last, I have one more component, which is going to be 3 beta k theta. Yes, yes, we're missing the strains. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to put them over here. Epsilon 1, 1, Epsilon 2, 2, Epsilon 3, 3. And I'm going to orient my coordinate system over here so that it's going to be 1, this is going to be 2, and this is going to be 3. And what do I know from the 1D strain condition? E11, Epsilon 1, 1 is 0, Epsilon 2, 2 is is zero, and uh, I'm going to assume also sigma one one is equal to sigma two two. Uh, something else I'm going to assume here is that the change of pore pressure is negligible. So if I have a negligible change of pore pressure, because the formation, let's say in this case, is very permeable, uh, or if if you had you're doing water flooding and uh, you are producing out of another wellbore, uh, you, you may have a negligible pore pressure because um, your objective there is not to change the pore pressure but just to sweep the fluids. But let's assume that there is negligible pore pressure so we're not going to get into, into the changes of stress due to uh, changes of pore pressure. And one more thing, I'm going to assume that the effective stress is uh, it's not zero, it's constant. The change of effective stress is zero. Okay, so uh, I can work now with my equations over here. Sigma 1, 1 is just going to be epsilon 1 plus this, 1 minus 2. And let's say the only one that survives is epsilon 3, 3 plus 3 beta k theta. And sigma 3, 3 is going to be this one. Epsilon 3, 3 plus 3 beta k theta. And what I'm going to do now is uh, same thing as we have done before. I'd like to obtain a solution for sigma 1, 1 as a function of sigma 3, 3 uh, without epsilon 3, 3. So same thing we have done b before, right? So so basically, I'm going to replace this one into there. So I get an equation as a function of sigma 3, 3. So I can write my equation. You, you can do the math on your own, OK? It's, it's, it's not too hard. But what you're going to get is that sigma 1, 1 is going to be equal to, let me check this, 1 
1 minus Poisson ratio sigma 3 3 minus 3 beta k theta plus 3 beta k theta. So now uh, you see if, if theta is equal to 0, what is sigma 1 1? It's just that, an equation we already knew where this is the effective lateral stress coefficient. But now if we have change of temperature, uh, that stress is actually uh, going to be different. And what we would like to do now is to explore what is going to be the change in lateral stress due to a change in temperature if the uh, vertical stress is constant. Uh, you can see from the equation over here that this is going to be equal to this guy times minus 3 beta k plus 3 beta k and 3 beta k, we have a 3 beta k and a 3 beta k over there. So uh, we can uh, replace that. And also, knowing that k is equal to Young modulus divided 3 times y minus 2 Poisson ratio, we can replace that in there. And if we do that, what we're going to get is that this is going to be equal to this. It, the 3 uh, goes, so this is 3 beta. This is 3, 1 minus 2 Poisson ratio. So all of this is k. That's a 3 beta k. And common factor, I'm going to have here uh, 1 minus Poisson ratio, 1 minus Poisson ratio. And that's going to result finally into the equation that we are looking for in which the change of lateral stress due to a change of temperature is going to be simply beta times the Young modulus divided 1 minus Poisson ratio. So similarly to what we did before, uh, now we can obtain a sort of a lateral stress coefficient uh, due to change of temperature. If, if you remember, uh, and we just see so that before, just with mechanics, the lateral stress depends on the lateral stress coefficient without tectonic strains. Uh, that's a simplified formula. If I uh, add changes in pore pressure, we know that that number is, was equal to A, where that A was alpha 1 minus 2 Poisson ratio divided 1 minus Poisson ratio. And now we have a new one, which is temperature, in which a variation of the lateral stress due to variations in temperature now is going to be equal to coefficient beta, which is something that we measure, same as alpha and Poisson ratio times Yam modulus 1 minus Poisson ratio. So uh, if you assume, for example, typical parameters that we have been using so far, uh, beta 10 to the minus 5, 1 over uh, 1 degree, if we assume a Yam modulus of 10 gigapascals, and if you assume a Poisson ratio of 0.2, you will see that all of that combining this equation is going to give you something about 0 0.1 MPA per degree C, which means that uh, you're going to have about the change of one tenth of an MPA per degree C. If you change the formation temperature uh, 10 degrees C, you're really going to have a change of lateral stress of about 1 MPA. 1 MPA is, is quite large. 
if you have a bigger change, even you're going to have a, a, a larger change of stress. What is going to be the impact of a change of lateral stress in, during injection? Can, can you tell me? I'm going to give you a hint over here. If you change the lateral stress too much, especially if you decrease the lateral stress too much, what's going to happen? There, there are two possible, oh, well, there are more than two, but, but two main consequences of that. You were saying, Robert? Okay, and how is that, how is that called uh, more rigorously? Full reactivation, right? So if you lower the stress here, you, you're going to lower the normal stress acting on this plane, and you may get these faults to reactivate. So number one, you could get full reactivation. And, and what else? Let's say, let's say that you're injecting. You're injecting, everything is okay, and, uh, and your pore pressure, let's say, it's at a given value, and you keep injecting at that pore pressure, and your total stress starts to go down, 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 and you keep at the same pressure. Let's say we're, you already cause full reactivation and, and then this continues going down. At some point, if your, uh, I don't know how to draw it over here, but uh, let, let's, let's just write it. Uh, if at some point, your pore pressure gets larger than your minimum principal stress, what are you going to get? You're going to get a hydraulic fracture. So probably you may be pumping and you say everything is fine. Uh, and after some time, if your stress is start to, to go down too much, at that same pressure that you were pumping, you may uh, trigger the initiation of hydraulic fractures because your stresses are going down. You, you didn't change your pore pressure, but you change the stresses which are uh, in the formation. And if the pore pressure gets larger than that, and it's enough to, to move the fluids inside, you're going to have a hydraulic fracture uh, opening uh, around this injector. And actually, that's, that's quite a, uh, I wouldn't say a, a common thing, but, but something that, that might happen more than what you think. And uh, always injecting cold fluids or just, you know, s uh, fluids at ambient temperature that maybe, you know, somewhere over here you may have a track which is delivering those fluids. That track is going to be at ambient temperature if you are in a cold place, like doing this in Canada, for example. Uh, these fluids are going to be very cold. If you inject them very quickly, uh, they are not going to have the time to heat up as they go down. If you lower too much the temperature, you may cause a hydraulic fracture. I'm finishing a paper with one of my former students, Ho Zhang Zhang, probably you, some of you know her. It's about this, but related to CO2 storage, CO2 uh, injection. In that place, even it wasn't that cold, it was a case in uh, Mississippi, if I remember well, and uh, there, is a, there is apparently a case in which uh, there was a hydraulic fracture happening after a certain amount of CO2 was injected because uh, the thermal stresses favored hydraulic fracture propagation. Okay, so how are we doing with that? I think we have time to finish this topic of thermal elasticity. Um, 
Any question so far? No? Okay. Uh, yes, Preston. Um, so realistically, the temperature change in the solid is going to be due to fluid rock interactions? Yes. During production, well, then were... not much, but but the problem is when you inject fluids at another temperature than the formation temperature. There is one case in which you can change temperature quite a bit by production, which is the case of methane hydrates. In methane hydrates, when uh, methane hydrates are like crystalline compounds with water and methane that whenever they come out of stability, when you lower the pressure, they have an endothermic reaction that lowers the temperature, temperature locally and that lowers the, the, the temperature in the formation. But if you, if you were just producing, very likely there are not going to be much change of temperature. The issue is when you were to inject other fluids in the formation that weren't there before. All right, so let me finish my artwork over here. Uh, and now we, now we can move on. Uh, all right, so, so far we, we talked about cases in which there is no gradient of temperature uh, with space. If you wanted to solve a, a general problem of thermoelasticity, uh, you can do this with free fem if you code equations into that software, or you could do it with another software like Comsol or something like that, you will have to solve the same equations that we have been solving so far. So most of you got this one right in the exam, but not all of you. In order to solve any kind of continuum mechanics problem, you need first equilibrium equations, which is that one. Second, you need the kinematic equations, right? And if you have small strains, we can simplify this to this equation. Yes, Robert? It's the divergence. In thank you. Thank you. I forget about that one often. Uh, this is the equation for small strains. Here, the transverse does the work of the cross derivative. And we need, last, we need our constitutive equation. And in this case, we have already written that constitutive equation. But now we're adding the component of temperature. And for this case of a general problem of elasticity, of thermal elasticity, we're going to have one more equation, which is heat transfer. So similar to pore elasticity, in which we have variations of pore pressure with time, now we have variations of temperature with time and space that depends on, this is thermal conductivity here. And this one is heat capacity. We have a, a gradient of temperature in space. And here we have the coupling term between temperature and strain. OK. So. There is almost nothing new in these equations. We know equilibrium, we know kinematic, we know constitutive. We have proved that equation and we saw it works very well for many cases already. Uh, this is the equation I just added. You already know that part. That's heat, heat transfer, right? And this is the heat uh, diffusivity term. The only new thing is now this. So what is this? Can you tell me what? physically what that term means. 
think, think about that while I write these numbers, okay? I'm going to write typical, the typical numbers that we have been using so far. Try to think about what that physically means. You, you remember the question of undrain loading? I'm going to look it up in my, my notes. So the undrain loading part came from that term over there and was something which is not in the, in the equations that without uh, pore elasticity. So let's see, uh, what is that? Okay, so look at this equation and look at that equation. Uh, it, this is the same thing, right? This is volumetric strain. So in the undrained uh, part or in, in the coupled pore elastic problem, we knew that we could cause changes of pressure due to changes of volumetric strain. If you cause a change of volumetric strain and you do not let the fluids come out, that's something called undrained loading. And uh, the, how much it changes depends on the BO modulus and the BO coefficient. And it is that term. So in this case, now we have the change in temperature that could be caused by change of volumetric strain. So this is considering the fact that sometimes when you strain something too quickly, you can change its temperature, right? Um, like for example, you get a wire and, and then you, you bend it and bend it back very quickly, it's, it's going to get hot and it's going to increase the temperature and it might break actually. Uh, in thermal elasticity, it's going to be that term. If you want to be picky and uh, solve the equation with that term, you, you could do that, but that term turns out to be relatively small. So if you combine like that number, say with a volumetric strain uh, quite large of 1%, you may get a change of 0.5 degrees. So unlike the undrained loading term that can result in very serious changes of temperature, Usually that term, as you may expect, for these very small strains on the problems that we are interested in, uh, usually are not, are not that high. So you may neglect that term if you want it. And that, just solve this part. Uh, solving that part, you can couple that with a, a thermoelasticity problem. All right. There is one more thing that we have to do. Uh, in uh, thermal elasticity before, uh, before going to the next thing. Oh, there are actually two more things, but uh, we'll see if we get to that. We didn't talk about pore pressure so far. And, and you could apply this same theory to a porous medium. Uh, it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's, it's going to be very similar. If we could go through the derivation of these equations, but that, that's going to take a lot of time. And uh, I prefer just to discuss about the already derived equations. So you can couple now pore pressure, and you will find this equation in Cousy's book that in order to uh, put thermal elasticity, we need to add a new energy term. 
So you remember that uh, when we talked about pore elasticity, we say we can add energy to the solid by adding volumetric strain, shear strain, uh, porosity strain with, with pore pressure. Well, now you can also add energy to the porous solid by injecting heat. Heat that will result into a change of temperature. And if you work through all those equations, then you will get a new version of the pore elastic equations that are very similar to the ones we already saw, but now have the thermoelasticity part. Mean stress, shear stress st remains still the same. Porosity, now we need to uh, put the component of thermoelasticity And we're going to have a new equation, which is entropy. I don't know much about thermodynamics, but I know that it's a quantity of energy. And with that one, you're going to be able also to, to derive your uh, heat transfer equations. So here, guys, I'm just kind of spitting out these equations uh, without much uh, thought about it. But the, the idea is that if you in the future face a problem of thermal elasticity, uh, you, were, you know where to go, and you know what are the equations required to solve that problem. C beta sub phi, where that beta sub phi is the beta of the solid Uh, weighted by the BO coefficient minus the initial porosity. So it's just one more equation. But with that one more equation, now you can solve problems of thermal, thermal poroelasticity elasticity in a very rigorous way, accounting for deformations, for porosity, and for also the energy uh, in the system. So uh, we, we could work through this, and, but that's going to take, as I said before, a, a lot of time. We have a lot of other cool stuff to go through. Uh, but now you could couple these two phenomena, right? Po changes of pore pressure, changes of temperature, all that together into strain uh, and stress. Uh, all right, so there is one more problem I'd like to discuss about thermal elasticity, and that's going to be the last one, and it's an application problem. 